Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben Whiting. I'll be your virtual MC this evening. I'm so excited for you to join us with an evening with Scott's Row and Pat Livingston. Uh, what I'd like to do first and foremost is say thank you to the National Writers Series sponsors who uh, have donated to this wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, I'm, we have a brief video we're going to play, so we hope you all enjoy that. I'm going to share that with you guys right now. much to our sponsors. Also, there's a few more people we need to thank. First and foremost, please, uh, I want to send a sincere thank you to our volunteers who today liver, delivered over 90 books and morsels from our community partner, Morsels, of uh, Scotch Rose Great Book, The Last Trial. We want to encourage everyone, if you have not picked up a copy of this book, please, please, please do so as soon as you can from your local book seller. Also, we want to say, if you enjoy tonight's conversation, please feel free to donate to the National Writers Series through our website. And without further ado, I'm exceptionally excited to introduce uh, our guest host as well as our featured author this evening, Scott, as well as Pat. I'm going to go out there. Uh, Scott, are you there, my friend? Uh, I am there. I, you know, chat, um, little chats are appearing on the screen. Some people are having trouble hearing. So, um but, and I, I, I assume that uh, for them, as it was with me, um, that uh, the problem is on, uh, it was on my end. And so I'm assuming it was on their end as well. All right. Hey, no worries at all. Pat, are you there, my friend? I am here, ready to go. Ready to go. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So I'll be taking care of everything technologically on this end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if... Uh, throughout the evening, if you have a question for Scott or Pat, please feel free to type it into the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you look down at the bottom, you'll see the ability to chat. That's where you can type in questions throughout the evening. Uh, type those in. They'll be filtered to me. And when we get to our Q&A section of the evening, I'll be sure to ask those to Scott and Pat. And without further ado, if you two guys are ready, let's begin uh, with the conversation, National Writers Series is all about expanding our perspective through excellent conversations with excellent authors, and I'm excited to hear what you two uh, have to deliver tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat. Thanks, Ben, and welcome, Scott, and welcome, everybody out there. I think we all wish we could be in the beautiful Opera House tonight, but thankfully, we're going to have this virtual conversation. And uh, uh, Scott, I know you would have liked to have been here today. The weather was fantastic, but we chatted yesterday and you, you've actually been to Traverse City. You've been here. I have. Um, and I have very fond memories of the smoke fish. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, I remember the smoke houses down on the water and I'm a, um, I'm a smoke fish aficionado. Um, so I, I, I love being in Traverse City. I thought it was a really neat place. And um, my wife, Adrian has life, lifelong friends in Leland. Uh, so we were eager to come back. Well, we hope you, you get back up here sometime. We're going to get to the book in a minute, but I want to take advantage of your legal expertise as a practicing lawyer. And let's talk a little current events, the, the Corona pandemic. And uh, in our state and other states, it's been very interesting that the governor's executive powers, their stay at home orders, have been getting legal challenges in the courts. How do you see that playing out? Do you have any opinion about this? You know, I, I would have to be expert, and I am not, on your constitution to know 
how that plays, uh, how that would play out. Look, it, it's, it's obviously a very serious matter when the government uh, tells people to suspend their normal activities uh, and you know, not to leave their homes, uh, not to go to work. Uh, and you don't want that done for any but the most serious of reasons. Uh, my view is that's exactly what we have going on. Uh, and whether, um, whether your governor actually has the power to do that, I suspect, since her um, orders haven't been suspended, that she does. In Wisconsin, the Supreme Court, uh, by a four to three vote, concluded otherwise. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I must say that my perception is that uh, there are a lot of people who uh, are not going to resume uh, a normal life, no matter what uh, the courts have to say. How has the pandemic changed your life and, and your family life? I know you're down in Florida. Uh, and part two of that question, has this given you any ideas to write about? Um, I, I do think uh, that there will be wonderful creative works uh, that come out of this period. Um, I don't have any particular um, perspective on it. We've stayed uh, in Florida because uh, our, we divide our time when we're back in the Midwest between a house in southern Wisconsin and a house uh, in Evanston, Illinois. And both houses have been occupied by our adult children uh, and, uh, and in one case, grandchildren. Um, so, uh, you know, there was, in, in order not to force anybody to move, uh, we stayed down here. Uh, we are going to return to the Midwest next week, and we're looking forward to it. Um, as a writer, I have found myself unbelievably distracted by all of this. Uh, and uh, I find it very hard to concentrate. And I know, uh, you know, I have enough faith in my own process at, at this age that uh, I know it'll work out eventually. But uh, it, this is a time unlike any other time in all of our lives. In your book, The Last Trial, Big Pharma plays a central role, the development uh, and approval of a new product, the imaginary product g -Livia, as a cancer drug. Um, with the research that you did on this book, what, can you, what do you think is going beh on behind the scenes now as we have so many companies, so many um, scientists around the world racing to try to find a, a cure and a vaccine for COVID-19? You know, I have a, a high degree of confidence that a vaccine will be found. What is illustrated in the last trial, though, is some of the perils of rushing uh, to market uh, with, uh, with a supposed wonder drug, because that's the circumstance uh, in the last trial. And of course, it turns out uh, that after a year of using this medication, uh, some people uh, literally dropped out of uh, an acute allergic reaction. So, um, and those are the risks if, uh, if this vaccine is brought to market without uh, adequate testing. Um, we'll, we'll figure out as a society uh, whether that's the right thing to do in the last trial it hasn't worked out very well for the developer of the medication, uh, Sandy Stern's client, Carol Pafko, who uh, is accused of knowing that there were these lethal side effects. And accordingly, he's accused of fraud and uh, insider trading and even murder. So tell us the process and your decision to bring back the celebrated attorney, Sandy Stern, in this book. Um, You know, I, I can't exactly remember when I decided I was going to write from Stern's point of view again, because I, I do remember a kind of eureka moment as I was thinking about um, my next project when I thought, and, and I had ideas about this book, uh, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, 
you know, this is, this is Sandy Stern's book. Uh, and uh, I, Stern has, has never left the scene, as it were, in my imaginary Kendall County, because I write about the law and lawyers and legal cases. Sandy Stern is sort of the first, the first citizen of, Ke of Kendall County. He appeared first as Rusty Savage's defense lawyer in Presumed Innocent. He was the central figure in my second novel, The Burden of Proof. And he's appeared in major or far more often minor roles, sometimes mentioned only in a sentence in every succeeding novel. So he's never been far out of mind. But in 2010, uh, I published a novel uh, called Innocent, which was a sequel to Presumed Innocent. Sandy, for reasons I can't recall, uh, and I don't know what motivated me to do this, but he had uh, advanced cancer. Uh, readers wrote me after reading the book and saying, please, please, Sandy Stern isn't going to die, is he? And I instinctively answered, no, he isn't. But um, when I wrote a paragraph about three or four years ago in my next, my last novel, Testimony, that mentioned Sandy Stern being at a party, uh, living in, quote, the alternate universe of cancer remission, I began saying to myself, wow, you know, this guy seems really fortunate to be alive for so long with stage four metastatic disease. What is he taking? What is he, what kind of therapy has he gotten? And uh, that really was the, the genesis of, of, of the last trial and uh, the, the, the wonder drug G. Livia, which Stern is taking uh, and which is, and is one reason at the age of 85, he agrees to represent his old friend, Kirill Pafko, because he literally, Stern literally owes Kirill his life. So I know the title is The Last Trial, but is this the last time we're going to hear about Sandy Stern? Is there another case out there for him, perhaps? Um, I think, I think Stern's children uh, would uh, tackle him and, uh, you know, bind him hand, hand and foot if he ever moved toward the courtroom again. Uh, I think once people have read the last trial, they'll understand why I say that. Uh, I, I don't think that it's the end of Stern's wisdom. So we may hear his voice again uh, in talking to other characters, but... Uh, at, at the age of 85, uh, I once saw an 84-year-old trial lawyer uh, at work, so I knew it was not physically impossible. But um, far beyond 85, I think that's a real task. So I know you've talked about this a little bit, but is, did Sandy Stern come from somebody that you, you know, or was he in your imagination or a combination of both? Well, um, you have to understand when I began writing Presumed Innocent, I was writing on the morning commuter train in these little 30 minute bits. And I thought I was getting somewhere. Uh, and uh, my then agent called me up and said, um, you know, how are you? What are you working on? And I said, you know, well, I'm writing this novel about a prosecutor uh, who's investigating the murder of his former lover. And she said, good, good, good. You know, you know what, you know what about prosecutors? You are a prosecutor. And she paused for a minute and said, but there's a trial in that book, isn't there? <laughs> and I, she was an intimidating presence in my life. I was afraid to say uh, no. So I said yes. And then I had to figure out who was on trial. Uh, and of course, the answer eventually turned out to be Rusty himself. But if he was on trial, he needed a defense lawyer. And I, my parents had a friend who physically and in manner uh, resembled Sandy Stern. He was a Cuban immigrant, not an Argentine immigrant. Uh, he was not a lawyer. Uh, but somehow uh, I borrowed Alex's mannerisms because there was something about him that uh, you could look across the room at this man and not think, uh, there's no way this guy's gonna make a deep impression on me. But when he started speaking, when he came into your presence, there was something magical about him. 
And I thought, well, that would be that would be a good trait to have as a defense lawyer as well. Great character. Just loved him in the book. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the other characters. We've talked a lot about Sandy. Maybe give us a line or two or some insight. So you've mentioned Carol Pafko. Right. Um, talk about him. Carol is um, a former Nobel Prize winner in medicine, uh, an esteemed and famous cancer researcher, um, but also, uh, as Stern finds out, a man with a lot of secrets. And uh, he's been Stern's friend uh, for about 40 years, but he's not somebody who Sandy thinks he knows at the core. Uh, and as I, as I explained before, he took, took the case largely out of a sense of obligation, um, which he's right to feel. Uh, but he's also apprehensive about, you know, what might come to the surface as he remarks to himself at one point, being somebody's criminal uh, defense lawyer is rarely a way to improve your opinion of him. Uh, <laughs> so he, he knows what he's taking on with Carol, but uh, it, it, it's a much more complicated, you know, basket of snakes uh, than he knew at the outset. Judge Klonsky. Sonny Klonsky made her first appearance in my fiction in uh, The Burden of Proof, where uh, she was uh, Sandy's antagonist uh, in a, an investigation of his brother-in-law. And uh, they developed a, an affinity for each other uh, that was, um, that bordered on the romantic. Uh, and uh, Sonny then uh, gave up being a prosecutor and became a state court judge and was uh, one of the two major figures in my fourth novel, The Laws of Our Fathers. Uh, and uh, somewhere in passing in one of the uh, one of the other novels I mentioned that she'd gone, a, gone across the street and become a federal judge. So she's now the chief judge of the federal uh, district court in the imaginary Kendall County. And I've always felt there were three characters I've written about who I felt closest to. One is Rusty Savage. Uh, another is Sandy Stern. And the third is Sonny Klonsky, uh, who's... Uh, sensibility uh, about the law is uh, is one that I think I share. And she's got, to me, she's always been a really neat person. Uh, so, uh, and, and I continue to think of her that way and, you know, whether she'll step forward in another novel, I can't tell you yet. The prosecutor in all this, Moses Appleton. Moses also made a, an appearance originally in The Burden of Proof. Uh, ironically, uh, Stern and his daughter, Marta, um, tried what proved to be Marta's first criminal defense case against Moses. And uh, he was an incredible gentleman. Uh, and that has been his, um, that has been his way uh, of approaching things uh, in in the years since. He's now the U.S. attorney. Uh, he was the first assistant U.S. attorney for many years. He's an African-American, uh, and he's that rarest of all birds, uh, a, you know, an African-American Republican. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but, you know, but he's got, you know, he's got a deep uh, philosophy about, um, the need for everyone to be responsible for and accountable uh, to themselves. And, uh, you know, he's, he's also um, in this complicated world, which is not that unusual in a courthouse. He's also a close friend of Sonny Klonsky's. They were trial partners together when they were prosecutors. So um, everybody knows everybody really well. You know, I, I thought it was interesting as, as a reporter that covered the courts and city hall, and you touched on this, and, and a lot of people may not know this, that, you know, the defense attorneys, the judges, the prosecutors, they, they all know one another. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes they socialize together. And then you come into the courtroom and you all have these different roles. 
that's a tough balance sometimes. And, and I thought you wrote about that very well in this book. You know, um, it, it is not an unusual career path for somebody to start out as a prosecutor, become a defense lawyer, and then become a judge. So uh, given that, uh, you're bound to know people in all these, all these different spheres and necessarily are going to know uh, if you're a judge, the lawyers who are pleading their cases before you. Uh, and uh, my friend, uh, Bill Bauer, who was the chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in Chicago, once said, if I don't know the difference between my business and my friends, then uh, I shouldn't be sitting up here. And uh, he was remarkably good about being objective without being hostile uh, to his friends. And, uh, you know, it, but it's tough. I mean, I saw when I, was a, when I was a prosecutor, the U.S. attorney was a man named Thomas Sullivan, one of my great mentors. And his closest friend in the world was a judge named Prentice Marshall. And they tried cases together. They'd been law partners. And Prentice Marshall was a very tough judge on the government. And I remember Tom, Tom going up, to Judge Marshall's courtroom and screaming at him, you know, with a courtroom full of spectators. Uh, and, uh, you know, they both calmed down and laughed about it afterwards. But um, it, 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 I, I'm not sure there's another profession where uh, you can be uh, so antagonistic with your close friends. You know, to me, a courtroom is, is such a great stage. It's really almost um, a field of play. Do you look at it this way? It's, it's, it's got a romantic um, sense to it. Yeah, I, I, um, I was sitting in a courtroom as a young prosecutor, and I'd always uh, argued with people. I'd been a writing fellow at Stanford, and my view was that um, you know, the best novel should be uh, enjoyable for both an English professor and a bus driver. And, uh, but figuring out what would capture a universal audience um, was not easy for me. And I was sitting in court, uh, probably in my second year as a prosecutor, and the government's main witness was on the stand in what was a um, minor case. It was a food stamps case. And, uh, but you couldn't hear a pin drop. Everybody was, was wrapped up in the story that this man was telling about how something that this community regarded as wrong or even evil, how it had happened. And it suddenly dawned on me. I looked at all of these people and thought, here it is. Here, here is the subject that will command a universal audience. Uh, the struggle between good and evil, the issues of to punish uh, and how harshly making rules that are firm but flexible, everything that goes on in a courtroom uh, is in, inherently dramatic. And despite people's belief about how boring the law is, uh, turns out to be appealing to a, a lot of um, so-called, you know, civilians. Um, and certainly that's true with jury trials, because if the lawyers can't explain things that in terms that people off the street can understand, uh, they're going to lose the case. So uh, a trial by its nature uh, bridges the divide between, you know, the priesthood of the law uh, and, and regular folk. Have you thought much about, and this kind of just popped into my head, is, is we're in the middle of this pandemic and, and trials will have to begin again and they'll have to be juries and they'll, they'll have to go deliberate and we have to practice social distancing. That's, right. it, that, to me, is going to be a bit of a challenge. Well, um, you know, a lot of legal proceedings now are taking place uh, remotely. The Supreme Court is hearing it arguments by teleconference, something I thought I would never live to see. Um, but the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution in a federal criminal case 
And the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution has been, as the lawyers say, impressed against the states, meaning everybody's got to follow that rule. That talks about a criminal defendant's right to confront yeah. the witnesses against him. And I think by most rational interpretations, that means that uh, the defendant gets the right to eyeball the witness against him across the courtroom. And uh, so it's going to be hard to conduct criminal trials uh, that are not in person. Can we have social distancing in the jury box? Sure. I don't see any reason that we can't. Um, we can even have social distancing among the courtroom spectators uh, if they're willing to sit far enough apart. Uh, and Lord knows you're, <laughs> you're at great distance from the judge anyway. <laughs> um, although a friend of mine wrote me a note recently about a court courtroom in uh, the suburban Chicago area, and it was uh, a bail courtroom, and it was very cramped, very small, very crowded, no distancing of any kind, and the, the judge uh, is at home now with COVID. So, uh, but I, I still think it can be done, um, it, but, you know, it's going to slow stuff down. Would Sandy Stern be as impress uh, impressive or persuasive um, via telecom as, as seen him in person? I don't think so. Um, you know, Stern in, in Innocent, uh, this novel that came out 10 years ago, was described by Rusty Savage's son as, as dumpy, that, you know, you would walk by him on the street and think nothing of him. But that when he stands up in the courtroom, it's like a beacon has been lit inside him. And, uh, you know, personal presence makes a difference. And a lot of Stern's magic as a criminal lawyer comes from his personal presence. Talk a little bit about the process of writing. Um, do you develop the story, then the characters? Just walk us through how you start to begin with an idea and start to write a book. What's your process like? My, my process um, is a, a little strange. Um, you know, I have friends that we, and sometimes when, you know, we'll talk about writing and I can't understand how anybody else writes a book um, except the way I do it. But if I'm at the stage that I'm at right now, where I'm starting on a new book, uh, I do not set any boundaries for myself. I will write anything down that comes into my mind about the situation that I'm, that I'm thinking about, you know, about a young investigator, uh, you know, where she's living, uh, what she, what she thinks of the takeout food uh, that, you know, she ate last night, uh, her personal life, um, you know, uh, and of course, critical events in the action of the novel. But I, I will, I could write about the Chinese food one day and, um, you know, the high point of the action, the next. And, and a lot of it is still inside my head. And, uh, I don't know what I'm going to choose to get out. Um, you know, my my wife reminded me the other night about a mosquito that's going to be a, a critical part of the evidence. So, um, you know, someday I'll, I'll be writing about the uh, mosquito. Once I've done that for about a year, uh, then I kind of look at it, and this goes back to Presumed Innocent, which I was writing in the same way, these scraps that I was writing on the morning commuter train. Uh, and then I go, well, I got to put this mess together. And that's when the first coherent draft emerges. Um, and, you know, that, and that's when a, a complete lack of discipline about structure um, becomes uh, quite disciplined. But uh, I, until that, that part begins, it's... Um, you know, uh, not probably a great comparison because I think he knew exactly where he was going, but Vladimir Nabokov uh, wrote all his novels on index cards. And I, I don't think he wrote, necessarily wrote in order, which is why he had them on index cards. And uh, I don't want to make any comparisons between myself and Nabokov, but um, it, it, it's the same kind of process. So do you write in order or do you go back and forth to different parts of the book, different chapters? In, in that first year phase, 
I can be writing the end one day uh, or what I think might be the end. Uh, and then, um, and then I, I'm back at the beginning, the next, and, or in the middle. Or uh, eventually when you get scenes that, that you like, um, you start, you, me, I start asking myself, okay, well, how did she get from here to there? What, what must have happened? Uh, and I have to figure out answers to the question. So is it more difficult to write the end? Is that the most difficult part of this? You know, it really, um, it really depends. One of the things I love about the last trial, um, I don't know if readers share my, my fondness for this, but the book actually uh, seems to end three different times. And um, so, and I, you know, the, that false ending was something that I found um, really amusing. Uh, because I knew that I was reading, I was leading readers along. Um, I don't recall when I knew the ultimate questions in terms of the last trial, was Kirill innocent or guilty? Uh, it sure wasn't at the beginning. Uh, and, but, and, and there were substantial changes in the, in the ending uh, between the drafts. So uh, now the book I'm working on now, I was fooling around with it for about three months. And then all of a sudden I was hit with what I thought was the great twist uh, and uh, in the next book. And, but it, it, I could just as well have worked on it for two years before figuring that out. When you're done with a book, do you look back and say, is there, is there a passage or a chapter that you say, I really like that. I really nailed that. That's exactly how I wanted to write that. And, and do you have a favorite chapter or, or scene in this book? Oh, I have. Um, there are lots of um, scenes that I like. I, I, I had a wonderful time writing this book. And my wife has reminded me that I would, uh, I wrote a lot of it down here in Florida. And uh, that she, she says, and she reminded me that I was saying this, I would, come out of my office and some days I would say, you know, it almost feels like I'm taking dictation. Um, you know, the voice was so um, thoroughly known in the lives of the characters. Um, so uh, there are many passages I like, uh, many parts of the book I like. I know my trial lawyer friends love a couple of the cross examinations that, that occur closer to the end of the trial. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that happens early in the book is Stern has practiced law for 30 years with his daughter, Marta. And, uh, you know, he is held on as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, Marta comes to him shortly after he agrees to represent Carol Pafko and says, Dad, I'm going to retire. Uh, and the idea of the 85-year-old who won't quit and his, you know, 55-year-old daughter, uh, who's like a lot of lawyers after a, a few decades at it, just eager to do something else. I, that, that just tickled me. And that happened purely on a whim as I was doing this kind of exploratory writing that I was talking about before, Pat. Well, I have to tell you, I, I loved the cross-examination of Ennis McBee. I thought that was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that chapter. I, yeah. I liked it a lot. I enjoyed writing it, but as I like to tell People, they say, oh, that's such a brilliant cross-examination. And I say, you know, I've discovered that cross is a lot easier when you not only uh, write the questions, but also the answers. Uh, and so, um, you know, you, you, it's, it's easy for the defense lawyer to look brilliant when uh, you can make the witness look less brilliant. My friends, thank you guys so much. It's amazing how much time has already gone by. And this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation, but we're actually to the point in our interview where we get to the Q&A section of the evening, if that's okay with, with both of you. Uh, Scott, we have a few questions coming in here on the chat. Uh, Amy Berger, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Amy asks, were you happy with all the movie adaptations of your novels, with the casting, etc.? cetera? Um. You know, people like to think that casting 
is like the grocery store. And you go and you pick any performer on the shelf that you might want. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. Um, and sometimes they're working on other projects. Um, a lot of it is caught up and with, you know, studio relationships and agency relationships. Uh, so it's, it's, it's narrower um, than you think. And, uh, and there are often great surprises. I, um, you know, I thought Harrison Ford did a great job in Presumed Innocent. I had desperately wanted William Hurt. And uh, I didn't know about the problems that Hurt was then having in his, in his personal life. Mm. And he was regarded as very difficult to work with. So I wasn't, when I suggested this to uh, Sidney Pollack or Alan Pakula, um, they nodded. Uh, and then, you know, then Alan had somebody else that he wanted. And then Harrison Ford at that point had been in uh, five of the eight top grossing movies in history. When Harrison Ford said he'll, he'll play the part, that was the end of the discussion. Uh, <laughs> there was no, uh, there, I could say whatever I wanted to say about that. And uh, I thought he did a wonderful job uh, and I enjoyed getting to know him. Um, and sometimes there are surprises. When Reversible Errors was filmed, um, you know, I, I was just ecstatic with the casting of William Macy, who did uh, a terrific job uh, as the lead character, Arthur Raven. Uh, I didn't know as much about Felicity Huffman. She was, you know, and I know she's had personal troubles, but she's a great actor. I mean, a great actor. Mm -hmm. And the person who turned in a performance that I didn't necessarily expect was Tom Selleck. And um, he, he's a very good actor. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I remember just the weird coincidence. I came back from the set and who was sitting in the reception area, but my um, dear and now departed friend, Brian Dennehy. And I, I sat down with Brian uh, and I told him where I'd been. And I said, you know, I said, Tom Selleck was great. And he says, Tom is a great actor. He says, the dumbest thing he ever did was jump into that, uh, that automobile, referring <laughs> to the first TV series that Selleck had ever, um, had ever been in. You know, sometimes actors get typecast in a way. I thought he was wonderful in that film. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. So my next question comes from Dindy, who says, you were a practicing attorney. What made you decide to go from that to writing novels? Well, this is a, a common misconception uh, about me. Um, I, my dream, is, even as a boy, was to be a novelist. And, uh, you know, I got to a certain point in my life uh, where I'd written, I think, three or four unpublished novels. And uh, by then I was teaching in the English department at Stanford at a very low, low, low level. And uh, I came to face the fact that I, I didn't want to be an English professor. Uh, and so much more interesting to me than anything going on around the English department was what my friends who had gone to law school were doing, especially the ones who were practicing uh, criminal law. And the, the big hang up for me about going to law school was n not any question about whether I was interested in it. I thought it was fascinating. The issue was what will happen to my dream of being a novelist? And because uh, people told me lawyers work much too hard to have time to write novels. <laughs> and, uh, but I just figured, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna let anybody else's expectations uh, become my own necessarily. So I went, made the decision to go to law school and uh, as you know, life is sometimes stranger than fiction, ended up with a book contract to write a book about being a law student. Uh, so, and I hadn't gone looking for that either, but it just happened. And I always say the great break of my literary career was going to law school. That's amazing. That's, that's such a, a great story. Uh, we have another question here from Laura. Uh, do you know any actual father-daughter legal courtroom teams? Um, I'm sure if I uh, scratched my head uh, for a while, 
I, I would be able to come up with it. It's not, it's not very unusual to have parent and child uh, practicing law together, uh, especially, I, I may be true in other areas. In my law firm, they wouldn't let it happen because we have anti-nepotism rules. But in a small firm, and criminal law is usually practiced in, uh, in, in small firms, uh, not always, but uh, in you know small firms, it's like a family business and people will bring their children in if, if they're interested. So, uh, you know, a guy named Sam Adam in Chicago practiced uh, for a long time with his son, Sam Adam Jr., who's, Sam was a great trial lawyer and so is Sam Adam Jr. Excellent, excellent. And we, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the craft of writing. We have a question here about the discipline of writing. Uh, someone just wants to know, Chris, do you, do you write every day even when you're not feeling it? You know, um, in, in my years at Stanford, I was out there as a writing fellow. And um, the founder of that program was the great American novelist, Wallace Stegner. And Stegner was a great teacher. Uh, but some of the stuff that stuck with me the most was Wally uh, saying, you, if writing a novel cannot be done on inspirations. Uh, it's a job, like every other job. And if you don't stick your rear end in a chair every day, uh, you know, it won't work. And Stegner uh, wrote two pages every day of the year except Christmas. And he said, his, his reasoning was in the 700 pages that resulted from that, there was going to be something worth saving. Uh, and at other times, he or Dick Scowcroft, who was uh, his second uh, in command in, in the program, uh, would say, look, you may not find the muse um, every day, uh, but you've got to sit down and at least give her a chance to visit. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I believe that that's correct. Oh, that's what, that reminds me of a great uh, story about Picasso. Someone said, you know, Picasso, you're working every day, why don't you just wait for the muse, the inspiration to hit you? He says, that's exactly what I'm doing. I just hope when the inspiration finds me, it finds me while I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> There's a great question here from, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, RJ Kingan. Uh, and this is a very specific question. How do you capture so well Sandy as an old man? Is it just your imagination or have you talked to someone for inspiration? No, uh, I mean, I had um, a grandfather whom I adored and spent a lot of time with. And um, I suppose that that has always fostered in me uh, an interest in and curiosity about older people. But, you know, I turned 70 years old last year. And uh, when you hit 70, you start thinking about what's ahead. And so it's kind of natural that I would be i um, curious about what life is like for an 85-year-old because, you know, mm -hmm. all I can do is knock on wood and hope that someday I'm an 85-year-old. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So the, uh, and this is a question, I, I really like this one. Um, if you were ruler for a day, what laws would you change? Oh, this is an easy one. Uh, I would change our campaign finance laws. Uh, mm -hmm because I think the view that contributing money or spending money uh, is an absolutely protected form of free speech is ridiculous. It's conduct. Uh, and you can see what uh, mischief and, and frankly danger uh, has been wrought in our political system by um, you know, the original case, Buckley versus Vallejo and it's later, uh, it, it, it's later um, progeny. Uh, and, you know, we have to get uh, our arms around the problem of unlimited campaign spending because it's distorting our democracy. And my biggest problem with it is that it gives the rich power in our society that nothing in the founding documents indicates they are supposed to have, but they have an, an enormous political voice by dint of how much money they have. And so you get, you know, you get the Koch brothers uh, or George Soros on the other side. Um, and, but 
it, it's not supposed to be the case that one citizen uh, by him or herself uh, can try to alter the outcome of, of our political process. So we've got to control political spending. And that's what I would do. So it sounds like you believe that uh, money is not necessarily free speech as much as it sounds like power. Well, um, obviously, when you pay for a political ad, uh, there are expressive elements. And uh, the line drawing, I admit, can be difficult. But if you start from the perspective of saying that there have to be limitations, I believe uh, that judges and legislators uh, can come up with reasonable solutions. Uh, but he, he, we have to allow uh, political spending to be regulated. I, I know we're going to get there someday. And I often say that Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, the, the Supreme Court decision that found political spending to be protected by the First Amendment, I, I say it will come to be seen as the Dred Scott case Mm -hmm. uh, of the 20th century, so wrongheaded uh, and so uh, fatal to so many good things in our democratic process that uh, it, it will be just like Scott, which of course, uh, you know, furthered the system of slavery. Um, it'll be just as stupid as that in the, in the view <laughs> of centuries to come. Uh, great point. Great point. And this is going to be our final question for the evening. Uh, this is from Clark Miller. And he says, uh, do you believe that justice is blind this day and age? If yes, what makes you think that? And if your answer is no, why should we trust the legal system? You know, uh, near the end of the last trial, um, Stern ruminates on justice as a lawyer season. And you know, in a case where the client is innocent, uh, then that's the only rational outcome. Uh, and any guilty verdict for an innocent client, uh, you know, is a travesty. But most cases aren't like that. And, you know, Stern thinks that um, there are several outcomes and, and the case of Kirill Pafko is one. There are several outcomes that would all be reasonable and, um, and in some ways just. And as usually happens in my, court, in, in my uh, courtrooms and my novels, um, justice is sometimes delivered outside the courtroom. Uh, and that's okay, too. Absolutely. Well, hey, thank you so much, uh, Scott. For giving us your time, as we all know, your most valuable resource is your time. And this goes to everyone. And the National Writer Series sincerely appreciates you giving a little bit to us. We'd like to encourage everyone, if you enjoyed today's conversation, please, please, please pick up Scott's latest book, The Last Trial, from your local bookseller. Not from Amazon, but your local bookseller. And I, also, should, I, should, remind, I should, you know... Humble brag, as the kids say, the uh, last trial has made its initial appearance on the New York Times bestseller list. So, and I a, believe it's number one at yeah, the New York Times bestseller uh, list. Number one, is, it's number eight uh, this week. Uh, it was number one on one of the Amazon lists, but uh, I'm I, happy for my publishers. I think it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Who can keep track of these things? Number one, New York Times bestseller list, the last trial, pick yours up from your local bookseller. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, the National Writer Series will be hosting a series of these. And so we sincerely hope you'll support us. You can visit the nationalwriterseries.org and donate to us. And that'll help us keep these great conversations going. I would like to send a personal thank you today to uh, Scott Tarot, as well as our guest host, uh, Pat Livingston. Thank you both so much. Uh, if you have any other questions for Scott or Pat, feel free to email them to us through our website. We'll be sure to get those along and get them back to you. And we hope everyone here has a wonderful evening and stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. And Thanks, have a Pat. wonderful night. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Hey, thank, thank you, guys. Both.